Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we're going to have a conversation and a discussion about wisdom, about pranya, but specifically, because this is part of a series I've been doing, we're going to talk about skillful wisdom, skillful pranya, which within the context of our series that I've been doing now for a few weeks, this should be interesting to talk about not just wisdom, but skillful wisdom. So just a quick reminder about kind of where pranya fits into all of this. Last week and the week before, I mentioned, because it was brought up during a discussion, I spoke a little bit about how the practice of Buddhism is usually divided into these three categories, shila, samadhi, and pranya, otherwise known as kind of morality or moral discipline, that's shila, samadhi, that's about meditation, so dhyana and samadhi and all of that, and then wisdom. And the idea is, is that these three categories all work together to form the path, to form the Noble Eightfold Path, to form the path of Buddhism. In other words, like you take the first category, moral discipline or shila, this is normally understood as things along the lines of precepts, taking vows or precepts and sort of avoiding certain things and doing other things in that way. But it's about morality, not killing, not being violent, not stealing, not lying, not being harsh with one's speech, things along those lines. Now, the idea is, is that you kind of need to be cultivating that shila, that morality, in order for the full fruits of meditation to pay off. Um, in other words, you know, if you're out there lying and being violent, and then you're like, oh, you know what? I got to meditate. <laughs> There's a sense in which your meditation is only going to be able to get you so far because of this immoral behavior in that way. We're going to have a lot to talk about moral and immoral behavior. So don't worry. That's, uh, you know, an interesting topic. So we'll get to that later. But the idea is you got to work on your morality to generate the fruits of meditation. And the idea is, is that one needs to fully generate a good meditation based upon a moral standing in order to develop the wisdom or the insight in that way. So that's, again, sort of a general division of the practice of Buddhism, that it's not just a system of morality or just a system of meditation or just a philosophy. It's all three of those working together and sort of supporting each other. So I mentioned last week that normally a sangha, uh, a community, would be supporting all three of those. A sangha would be a community where we go to get support for our moral practice in that way. And I mentioned, I think last week, that the sangha is would also be a place to confess, might be the word, but that idea of owning up to uh, moral irresponsibility and then getting the support of the sangha to kind of stay on the path. And then, of course... The Sangha, like at the SFDC and a lot of Dharma centers, is a place for meditative practice. So it, the Sangha is a place to cultivate meditation together and get that kind of support. And of course, a Dharma center like SFDC and a class like Dharma Doors that I teach here on Sunday night is all about cultivating wisdom. So in the Dharma Doors, this Sunday night class, we focus on the sutras, we focus on reading the Buddhist texts and basically exploring the wisdom in that way. So the other few nights we've been looking at 
what are called the paramitas, the practices of a bodhisattva, which are also based basically given in those three divisions. There are six paramitas, practices of a bodhisattva, generosity or giving, dana is the first. Shila, moral discipline, is number two. Number three is kshanti, patience. The fourth is drive or determination, get up and go, called virya or vigor. The fifth paramita is dhyana. You could also call it samadhi, but it's about meditation. And then tonight we're doing the six, but we're and talking about pranya, wisdom. But the series that I've been doing here, because we've been kind of reading, and tonight we are going to read more, of a particular sutra that is called the Skill and Means Sutra, or the Upaya Kashalya Sutra. So we've been looking at this idea of upaya, skillful means. And when I introduced this topic a while ago, I mentioned that upaya is very much a Mahayana Buddhist idea. It's a Mahayana Buddhist kind of concept. And it's very much a part of the Bodhisattva path, skillful means. Now, I'm not going to repeat all the previous classes, of course, but I just want to make one point very clear. So... Buddhism, the tradition, gets divided into these two major divisions, right? Sort of the early practice or the early path that is sometimes called the Hinayana and the Mahayana. And what I've been doing the last few weeks is talking about each of the paramitas and the way that that paramita, the way that that practice was understood in the early form of Buddhism versus the bodhisattva path. And the primary difference, just to put this very, very simply, the primary difference between early Buddhism, the more monastic kind of forest dwelling tradition, the difference between that and the Mahayana is that the early path or Hinayana, it's called, at least by the Mahayana, it is called the path of individual salvation, the path of individual liberation. And what that means is, is that the entire focus, the all of the practices, everything is about my liberation, my mind, clearing out the defilements of my mind, and eventually my liberation. And there's an understanding that that's what Buddhism is for, is for each individual to get liberated. The Mahayana Buddhist path and the Bodhisattva aspect of that path is not interested in personal individual liberation. A Bodhisattva is interested in universal liberation. This is where they talk about the liberation of all sentient beings. And when the Mahayana Buddhist tradition talks about liberating all sentient beings, it's not just talking about all people. It's talking about every sentient creature being liberated from suffering. And that's kind of a different thing than just trying to alleviate one's own suffering. So you get these sort of two different paths in that way. Now, the practices, the teachings, the practices, a lot of that is all exactly the same. It's just about intention. And of course, the Buddhists are very interested in what is called samkalpa, intention. What is your intention in doing this? And again, the difference of these two paths is that the intention of the Hinayana, the intention of the early path, is individual liberation. I'm going to get out of samsara. I'm going to end my suffering. Versus the intention of the Bodhisattva is this intention to liberate all sentient beings. 
which includes themselves. I always like to make that very clear. The Bodhisattva is aware in that way that they are kind of a sentient being, of course, and so they're included in that. So we want to start tonight, even, you know, I'm already started, but what we're going to start with is a quick reminder of what, what constitutes wisdom in the Hinayana. Like what exactly is Panya? So if, if, you, if you know, I'm sure you probably do, that that early path, the Hinayana, everything is in the Pali language. All the texts are in the Pali language, all the teachings, the, even the tradition is still preserved in the Pali language. So this word for wisdom is Panya. In Sanskrit, it's Pranya. And I will you I'll, as usual, I use Sanskrit, but I just, in case you only know the Panya, that's what we're talking about. And in the early Buddhist tradition, if you were practicing the morality, so you were on the path of Shila and fully cultivated in, in that, and you had done all the requisite meditation, there is an understanding that there can arise or come about a series of insights, realizations, wisdom, panya. And ultimately, and by the way, of course, this is going to really depend on exactly who you're talking to. Different teachers and different sects have slightly different interpretations. So I want to let it be known right now, I'm giving you the kind of broadly, generally accepted definition of panya. But the broad you know, definition of that is that Panya in the early Buddhist tradition was specifically about having a realization of three things. The first, and these are sometimes given in different orders, but I'm going to start with the one that I think is the most easy to grok, the most easy to understand. The first aspect of wisdom in the early tradition, it was the teaching of impermanence. That to be wise, to have insight, was to understand and, and know that all phenomena, all things, are impermanent. Now, I start with that because there's a way in which actually we in the modern world, like me, we in the 21st century, there's a way in which we actually kind of already accept this idea that all things are impermanent. And I say that just because the, you know, the general, you know, the general scientific view of the world whether you know about the laws of thermodynamics or not, but the general kind of scientific view of the world is a kind of about flux and change and things decaying and you know falling apart in that way. So there's a sense in which we already understand or think in terms of impermanence. And it should be understood that in the at the lifetime of the Buddha and kind of the Indian culture of 500 BC, there were an, a few things that were understood to be not impermanent. Yeah, sure, uh, my sand castle that I build at the beach is impermanent. And sure, my even my real house that I build out of bricks is impermanent. But there was understood to be sort of certain, you would almost maybe call them spiritual things that were understood to be permanent, like eternal. And one of those things that was understood to be permanent or eternal was something called the Atman or Atta in Pali, Atman. And even though a lot of modern teachers will translate Atman, especially if you're a Buddhist teacher, you often translate that as the idea of a self. But I want you to know, of course, that the Atman, the idea of the Atman is closer to the idea of a soul. And what I mean by that is, 
the Atman in Indian philosophy, Indian wisdom of the time of the Buddha, the idea was is that the Atman is the true self, not the um, male Michael Californian person. That's just this lifetime. But the idea was, is that there's like kind of deep down inside, there's an immutable, unchanging, eternal Atman that is what pops out and gets reincarnated in a new body. And depending upon your karma, depending upon your actions in your life, you get reborn in a different kind of body, maybe as an animal, maybe even as a god. But based upon your karma, the Atman will then get reincarnated again and get reincarnated again. And at the time of the Buddha, there was a generally accepted cosmological view that the Atman was permanent, again, eternal and unchanging. And it was only this that changed. So when the Buddha came along, and had his great realizations and had his enlightenment experience, one aspect of that was the realization that everything is impermanent. Everything. In, and we're going to talk about Atman in a second, but that teaching at the time of the Buddha that everything was impermanent was actually going against the grain of sort of standard religio-spiritual practice of the time. Now, the idea, of course, is, is that you, you might not believe in a soul in that way. And you might think that that gives you a leg up in terms of understanding the idea of impermanence in that way. But the idea is, is that, and now this is where I kind of want to start to really dissect the wisdom so I tell you this about impermanence. And I mention even that basically some, you know, the laws of thermodynamics are almost talking about impermanence in that way. So just because we know about this teaching of impermanence, and just because we can kind of conceptually, intellectually know, even if we know it's true, Wisdom, the panya or pranya that they're talking about in the early Buddhist tradition, is not just knowing things are impermanent, but acting in accord with that knowledge. And so my point is, is that, you know, an aspect of the Dharma, an aspect of Buddhism, is that we are holding on and clinging to things very tightly. And there's a way in which, take, for example, our bodies. There's a way in which, even though we know about impermanence, there's still a way in which if I were to like lose a tooth, <laughs> it would make me very upset. Yeah, I was thinking of you, Noe, I, I, I really was. <laughs> but the idea is, is that it could make us very upset if that happened. And if you looked under that, like the, the getting upset about that, you might notice that it's you holding on to your body being a certain way and kind of being like, hey, don't change, don't change. And then when things start to change, if our hair starts to gray or teeth fall out or what have you, if it's making us upset, it's that's then you don't know things are impermanent. <laughs> you are kind of hoping that it wouldn't go the way that it should, which is that things decay and fall apart in that sense. So again, knowing intellectually about impermanence and then really abiding in impermanence and acting in accord with it, that's two different things. And pranya is about the wisdom that not just understands it, but acts accordingly. So... So that's the first insight of early Buddhism, that all phenomena, even if it doesn't appear to be so, all phenomena is impermanent. Okay. 
The second insight constituting wisdom of the early tradition, it was the teaching that all phenomena, all of this stuff, in addition to being impermanent, all of the dharm, all of these things, they call them dharmas, phenomena, all of these things are a cause of suffering, a cause of dukkha. All things are dukkha producing, suffering producing. Now, this is one that I can speak only for myself. This is one that I definitely understand intellectually, but do not behave fully accordingly. And what I mean by that is, is that I'm still very kind of under the impression that some of these things are giving me pleasure. <laughs> I'm still under that impression regarding a few things. I have definitely gotten over the idea that certain things are pleasure producing. For example, I'll give you a personal example. At some point along the way, I won't get into the details of it all, but at some point along my journey, I did finally, in a sense, begin observing the fifth precept. So the pre fifth precept is about intoxication, particularly about inebriation and drunkenness. So for many years, as a Buddhist, like, you know, practicing Buddhist, teaching Buddhism and all of that, I still was under the impression that having a few beers was pleasurable, that it was a good time. So that was, I, I was under that impression. And again, I don't, I won't, I won't go into the nitty gritty and the details, but basically there was a moment and it didn't really happen overnight, actually. It was kind of slowly, but I ultimately basically realized, I was like, you know what? I'm poisoning myself. This, and I started to recognize that I was actually doing that. Like in a very like visceral way, I realized that I was really kind of damaging my body. And I would, it's not that I had, I, I didn't drink to excess. It wasn't that I was having, you know, alcohol related symptoms in that way. It was just literally that I realized that being drunk was being sick. I, I don't know how else to put it in that way. Like I just recognized that it wasn't at pleasurable. And at that moment, I just stopped drinking. I just haven't basically had alcohol for a very long time now because I just got over that understanding that it was pleasurable. I realized that it was actually causing dukkha, suffering. I could get into the other, you know, all the nitty gritty about interpersonal relationships that were affected by it and realizing that those interpersonal relationships were suffering because of it. But I thought it was, again, pleasure, all of these things. But that's just regarding that. <laughs> I, again, I'm still very much under the impression that certain things are giving me pleasure in that way. Now, I will say this, so I don't want to make, I don't want to get it, give anybody the wrong impression. I do not practice the early form of Buddhism. I don't teach the early form of Buddhism. I mean, I teach about it in that way, but I don't like promote that monastic celibate form of Buddhism in that way. So kind of what I want to get around to is the early form of Buddhism like the forest dwelling monastic form was very negative about this world. In the early Buddhist tradition, in the Hinayana, in Theravada Buddhism, or at least original Theravada Buddhism, you don't want to have anything to do with this world. You don't want to have a job, which is about livelihood, you don't want to have a mortgage. You don't want to have kids. You don't want to have all of that. In fact, you're trying to move away from the world. There was a, a way in which you really weren't supposed to enjoy food. 
It was just about begging and sustaining the body, you know, eating only once a day, eating only leftovers that people threw in your begging bowl. And so the early Buddhist tradition had this kind of, if you're familiar with this term, I would call it very Gnostic. A Gnostic attitude around the world is one where the world is just suffering. The world is just no good. And so you want to kind of get out of it. You want to have nothing to do with it. And you ultimately don't want to be re uh, relying upon it for your pleasure in that sense. And so the teaching or the insight was the realization that all phenomena in the world is dukkha producing, suffering producing. Now, I, again, I recognize, or at least I think, that the early Buddhist tradition was too puritanical in that way, a little too um, one-sided in that sense. And if you study the Mahayana with me in Sunday nights and all of that, we talk a lot about how the Mahayana recognized that the Hinayana was too, um, too negative, frankly, like about the world. And that that was sort of a problem unto itself. And the things that we're going to read tonight, and I will get to them, are going to be about enjoying, the not enjoying, but experiencing the pleasures of the world. So I'm kind of getting us ready for that. But I don't want to leave the second insight of dukkha. I don't want to leave that in such a negative state, because there's great wisdom to this teaching. So the way that I understand this second insight about suffering, the way that I understand it is from kind of birth, there's a way in which we are seeking, whether it's uh, mother's milk, or, what, or whatever it is, there's a way in which we seek things outside. And then whether it's uh, nursing or whether it's, you know, playing with our toys as a, as a child or whatever it is, there's a way in which we get pleasure from things outside of us. And all through childhood, there's a way in which that behavior is constantly reinforced to the point that when we're adults, it seems as if the only way to be pleasurable is to be watching something, be listening to something, be eating or smelling something, being touching something or being touched, particularly naked bodies touching each other, so tactility. And then even if it's not something of the five senses, there's a way in which we like to have our minds entertained with ideas in a way. And so we are getting our pleasure from entertainment outside, music outside, all these other things coming in. And then I get them and I'm, I'm happy. And what the Buddha recognized about that is a couple of things, but an aspect of the wisdom of, of Buddhism is the recognition that that way of, of getting pleasure, it only works as long as you have the thing. And then what has happened is, is that you have conditioned yourself to need that thing in order to be pleased. And so when that thing isn't there, mm, we are not happy. Uh, and that is the, as I, as I understand it, that's the Buddhist teaching of the wisdom of all of this is dukkha producing. All of this is suffering producing, but not because eating a donut is suffering. Eating a donut is, is one of my favorite things to do, frankly. But the point is, is that if I'm getting pleasure from eating donuts, then the day I go to the shop and they're out of donuts, 
no. And so the thing that was giving me happiness has now become the thing that is giving me suffering. So I've kind of set myself up to fall. And the Buddha recognized that about, out, I call it outsourcing our pleasure. And so the wisdom is, is that there is methods, primarily quiet meditation, but there are methods of deconditioning ourselves of such wanty, needy behavior. And what can happen is, and this is what the Buddhists are talking about, as far as I, I'm concerned, you can reach a point where you don't need or want anything. And that, they say, is a much higher state of pleasure than anything you could ever get from the outside. That to be sovereign, independent, it leads to pleasure, leads to sukkaha, bliss, the exact opposite of dukkaha. So dukkha, sukkha. So they talk about the bliss of dhyana, the bliss of meditation. And the way that I teach that, the way that I experience that is that the pleasure is coming from being free and not needing anything. So the insight about the suffering nature of all of this stuff is something to consider, all right? Any questions about the first two insights of early Buddhism? You've all heard this before. This should be common knowledge. The third insight of early Buddhism is what is called the realization of the insight of anatman. No atman. No soul. No essence. No eternally transmigrating atman. There just isn't a soul. It's actually not even that it is impermanent. It's just actually a complete fabrication of desire and delusion in that way. Now, when in the early Buddhist tradition, when they talk about the teaching of no atman, of anatman, they do have a very interesting twist on the idea of the Atman and the idea of no Atman. And that's where most Buddhist teachers, myself included, by the way, often, most Buddhist teachers then sort of simplify the teaching of Atman as just calling it the self. And then, of course, the teaching of the third insight of early Buddhism is that there is no self. And it's, I think it's, you know, it's certainly pedagogical and expedient to just summarize the Atman as a self and then say, oh yeah, Buddhists teach no self. But there's kind of a particular connotation to this idea of a self that doesn't exist. <laughs> And what it is, and this is sort of where I, as a teacher, try to combine the original teaching of the Atman, which is about the soul that's transmigrating through samsara, through the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. So there's that idea of the Atman as a soul, and then this idea of the Atman as the self, as like me. And the way that I kind of teach this, and again, I, I'm, I'm setting us up for the text. So the, the way that I teach this, it, it's kind of simple if you think about it. The way that I teach this, it's, it's, the idea that, it's the idea that we have about ourselves. And what I mean by that is, is that we think about our our infancy or our when we were a baby or you know a, a young toddler in that way as far back as we can remember there's a sense in which we say oh yeah when i was a kid i lived in southern california 
And I remember going to my first day of kindergarten. And I remember having my little lunch pail and being all afraid of the first day of school. And then I remember growing up and I remember going to high school. I remember going to my prom and I remember my prom date and all of that. And then I remember going to college, you know, all of that. So boop, 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 boop. And now here I am teaching, teaching the Dharma. The idea of a self, like the self that the Buddhists are saying doesn't exist. When I tell you that story, or when you tell yourself the story of your past, when we tell it, when we think of it, I, or we all sort of do this thing where there's this idea that, that it was me there going to elementary school, that it was me there going to my high school prom, as if I was somehow the little pilot of my life behind the eyes and between the ears. And even though I have gotten a lot taller over the years, there's the idea that all the while it was me back there. And this is where the, the Buddhist, the Buddha, has had this realization that that very notion that it was me back there, it's diluted. It, it's not the case that you went to elementary school. They wouldn't let you in. You're too tall. You're too old. And But we have a tendency to wrap up the entirety of our past. And by the way, we look for, we look to the future and we go, you know, I'm going to be somewhere. So way down there. So there's a sense of self that is holding all of childhood, all of adolescence, all of that, and even some fictitious unknown future. And we're holding all of that as me. And that's just, if you just think about it, it's not true. But what I'm getting at is, is that that's the idea of an immutable, unchanging you that was behind the eyes and between the ears, being the recipient of all of those experiences. That's the idea of an unchanging, immutable self, soul, Atman that it was just back there all the time, experiencing everything, but not changing, just being the experiencer. Versus this right here, right now, hearing my voice, this, this is closer to you. Not last week, not last month, not when you were a kid, but this experience right now that is arising is going to be closer to a self. But what we notice if we have our thinking caps on tonight, that self has already changed. It's already a new self for all kinds of reasons, you know, but that's the teaching of early Buddhism that there is this ever morphing, ever changing amalgamation of five aggregates, these five skandhas, the physical body, sensations, what we're perceiving, how we're conditioned, and then ultimately the emergent state of consciousness now. And the idea is, is that you are already thinking about something different than you were thinking about a second ago. So the consciousness has changed, your perception has changed. Over enough time, the whole physical form changes. So there's just change, and there's this present moment in that way. Where we get confused is where we start to imagine that there's some self cruising through space and time, back there somewhere. That's You will never find that self. 
It will always only just be an idea. So once again, though, there's a huge difference between understanding all of that and living in accord with all of that. All right. So that's the what constituted wisdom in early Buddhism. That was pranya or panya, to know all things were impermanent. And by the way, it's because they're impermanent that they're suffering producing. That's part of the package deal. It's what makes us so upset about them. Why they're producing suffering is because they're impermanent. And this teaching of no self. Okay, now, any questions about anatman, dukkha, or anicca, impermanence? All right, and once again, yeah, that's all early Buddhism, and we all kind of know that, or again, have probably heard it before. In the early teaching, in the early Buddhist path, all of that wisdom led to the ending of my suffering. Yeah. So the idea again of early Buddhism is that it was a path of individual salvation. So how would then the bodhisattva understand pranya? How would the bodhisattva practice this wisdom if they are kind of interested in this idea of universal awakening, the awakening of all sentient beings? Well, I'm going to return to our sutra. I'm going to actually take, and, and I, I haven't read from the sutra for a minute, so this doesn't actually matter, but I'm taking a step back from where I left us off last time. And I had read a little section, and if you have the yellow book, if you have the Chang translation of A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, I'm back on page 430, and it was a section where the Buddha was describing how it is that you can practice generosity and actually fulfill or accomplish all other five paramitas just by practicing the first paramita of giving. And so the Buddha went through these kind of various ways in which one can practice patience, one can practice moral discipline via giving. And I've already read this, but I want to reread it and kind of do a better uh, job of explaining it. So this is how the bodhisattva practices pranya, wisdom, via giving. After having given, so after giving, the bodhisattva analyzes these matters. Asking, who is the giver? Who is the recipient? Who is the one who receives the karmic results of this giving? After contemplating, the Bodhisattva finds that there is no giver, there is no recipient, and there is no one who will receive the karmic results of this giving. This is the paramita of pranya, wisdom. So this is a very like classic formulation of what would be called skillful giving or upayak giving, right? Or sorry, skillful wisdom. Upayak wisdom. And what it is, is here they're talking about a bodhisattva practicing the first paramita, so being generous. But then in being generous and giving, they reflect who's the giver? Who's the recipient? And who is it that will get the karmic rewards for this giving? Now, what you need to know is, in the early Buddhist tradition that I was describing at the beginning of the talk, 
if someone, anyone, were to give something, were to be generous, there is an understanding in traditional Indian culture, there is an understanding that that person who gave would then receive punya, a kind of karmic reward. Uh, they call it merit, but it's this idea that it would be that there would be a benefit to that, a spiritual, metaphysical benefit to giving. And in the early Buddhist tradition, there was almost a sense in which, almost like a video game, frankly, the more you gave, your little uh, punya meter went up, your little merit meter went up, bing, 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 and then, oh, I'll give you this, oh, bing, bing, bing. And so I'm getting more and more punya or more and more karmic results. And there's an idea that the more punya I get, the more karmic results, the better my future rebirth, the better my future uh, path in that way. So in other words, the giving, I, I was the one that gave, <laughs> I gave something to you, and therefore I'm going to get the merit. You, you get the thing. <laughs> That's what you get. You get whatever I gave you. I get merit or punya in, as a result of that. And again, there was an idea that you needed to accrue merit in order to, and, and actually, let me mention this. In the early Buddhist tradition, they weren't really interested in rebirth because they didn't believe in an a, Atman. They didn't believe that there was really such thing as rebirth in that way. But they did believe that accruing merit was a requisite to enlightenment. It, so there was an understanding that you needed to be generous or you needed to cultivate merit in all kinds of ways, but you needed to actually get your punya meter up in order to get not suffering and to get enlightened in that way. So here, when the Bodhisattva is contemplating who's the giver, who's the receiver, and who's getting the punya, and then comes to this realization, after contemplation, they realize there is no giver. There is no recipient, and there is no one who will receive karmic results. And that's the paramita of wisdom. So there's a bunch of different you know, ways that we can come at this, but I'm just going to, because I do want to read a little more, so I'm just going to kind of put this very simply. The Mahayana path, the Bodhisattva path, it's, uh, it's different for a few reasons. The primary reason, as I've already mentioned, is that it, the focus is, is upon universal uh, liberation not just individual liberation, but there's an, a philosophical, you would even call it a dharmic principle that sort of underlies all of Mahayana Buddhism. We talk about it almost every Sunday night, and it's the teaching of what is called emptiness, shunyata. And the teaching of emptiness is a profound teaching. Again, I wind up giving a spiel about emptiness almost every Sunday night. And in many ways, it is, I think of it as an extension or kind of an extrapolation of the essential teachings of the Buddha from the original form of Buddhism. And the teaching of shunyata is present in the early form of Buddhism. But the general idea of emptiness, well, it's sort of about, and I'll put it kind of very simply, like there's so many ways to teach emptiness, it's not even funny. But the basic idea of emptiness is understanding that when we look at things, or even when we think about ourselves, but any 
object, any individuated object. And one, you know, one that I use a lot is my, my, my clock here. And the idea that I use a lot to describe emptiness is this idea that if I showed you this, you'd think that I have a clock in my hand. And when you say that, oh, look, it's a clock. What we don't really notice is one, this is a button. These are some knobs. There's a bunch of um, mechanical parts in there. There's numbers, there's these things. There's all these different things. So this is actually a pile. <laughs> it's a pile of stuff. But your mind can wrap all of that up into just one thing, a clock. Now, the funny thing about this is that this doesn't work. It's broken. So it doesn't keep time. Yet, you would probably still think that this is a clock. Is that a clock? This is... You might, I don't, I don't know if you think this is a clock, but it, it doesn't keep time. <laughs> it's flat. It, does, it, it doesn't keep time. I know the old story about a broken clock being right twice a day. But my point is, is that this isn't a clock. It looks like a clock, but it's not. It looks like one. Guess what? This doesn't keep time just as much as this doesn't keep time. So this isn't a clock. It looks like a clock. Now, what I'm pointing at now is two, is one thing is the way that your mind can wrap all of the parts up with just the stroke of a word, clock. And your mind now can only, I mean, you, you can obviously toggle, but my point is, is that there's a way in which the mind that has that word clock, there's a way in which it's just holding this as one object, right? And then that one object is a clock. And what I want you to realize or think about is how if I grabbed somebody from like an, you know, an, an untouched Amazonian tribe, a person that has never, ever seen or used a mechanical clock, they have always only used the sun as an indicator for time. So they don't have any notions about modern timekeeping devices and all of that. If I showed that person this, are they gonna see a clock? They don't have such a word. They don't have such a concept of a mechanical timekeeping device. And so now I've taken the clock, which is the one object, and I've shown how the one object is only in your mind because this is, an, is a bunch of things. So the singularity that you're calling a clock is only in your mind. And the very idea of a clock is only something that you could in a way have in mind, or it is because of the conditioning of your mind that you could even entertain the notion of a clock. What all of that says is that the belief that there's just a clock here, the clock is empty. There's, there's no clock here. So that's empty, but this is where it gets interesting. So remember my clock, but now it's a button, two knobs, some numbers, a couple of these, this, and 
Look at that. This used to be part of the clock, <laughs> meaning this used to be the clock. But this is one of those parts of the clock. And guess what we have here? Another one of those singular entities. The battery. Is this just one thing? It looks at least like, I don't know, two or three things. And that's not considering the battery acid inside. That's not considering all the stuff inside. So what we realize is that this battery is also a reified singularity and that the very idea of a battery is another one of those concepts that you're conditioned to think in terms of. The classic black and gold or black and copper is, it, oh, it's a battery, right? So what I'm getting at is, is that the teaching of emptiness goes for any reified singular object. But the problem with that is that it's reified singular objects all the way down. So that's where you get to everything being empty because at any point when the mind is isolated on a singular object that has a name label function, all of that's pure conceptualization. But the degree to which we think they are real objects out there, that's what's empty. Now, that's a clock or not a clock. <laughs> the basics of the Buddhist teachings here are about how this is an assemblage of parts. Michael is a one of those reified singularities where actually there's ears, a nose, a tongue, a body, brain, lungs, spleen, liver, all of the parts. But with the stroke of a word, with the stroke of a concept, Michael, all of this gets wrapped up into a reified concept of self. But it's not that it's ears, a nose, eyes, all the parts, because each of the parts is also a reified object idea. And ultimately, if you've ever read the Heart Sutra, this is the message of the Heart Sutra, that the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, while practicing this Pranya Paramita, this profound wisdom, realizes that the skandhas are empty. The Bodhisattva realizes that the parts are empty, not just the idea of an Atman, not just the idea of the self. The parts are empty too. And so that teaching of emptiness that teaching of the bodhisattva uh, understanding that all these singularities, oh, look, a lamp. Nope. Light bulb, shade, stand, cord. It is only the mind that wraps all of that into just the lamp. So if you understand that teaching, we just did the contemplation that the bodhisattva does when they come to the realization, oh, there is no giver. There is no recipient. There is no one to receive the karmic rewards for this. All right. So I, I'm go, about to go even deeper, but any questions, comments, answers, ideas about emptiness, no self, any of that? complicated stuff. Okay, so here's where things get a little deeper. So the Bodhisattva, after contemplating 
understands that there is no giver, no recipient, no karmic, re nobody to receive karmic rewards. So why bother giving? <laughs> or better yet, what are we talking about? Right? Like, there is no giving then, then the, what, you know, kind of uh, what's the point, or if there is no giver, no receiver, and no buddy to receive karma, then why do this? Why be generous then? Well, here's the idea. And this is very much the bodhisattva ethos, if you will. There's basically this understanding, and if we take, if we take the practice or the action of giving or its opposite, uh, you know, not sharing, being stingy, hoarding, right? So those are kind of our two options in a way. We could give or we could hoard that kind of, no, it's, it's mine. And what the Bodhisattva recognizes is that, well, even the early Buddhist teachings, of course, recognize that the delusory, the deluded sense of self, that's the, that's the cause of suffering. Yes, it's, it's clinging, wanting, and craving, but it is that self that is doing the wanting, cleaving, clinging, or craving. So if you come to a deeper realization about no self, it alleviates the problems of clinging in that way. So the no self thing and or emptiness, what the Bodhisattva recognizes is that there are certain behaviors that reinforce the delusion of self that reinforce the behaviors that produce suffering, that reinforce it all. And there's other behaviors that undo it. Now, what we're trying to get to here in this, in, for tonight, we're trying to get to that wisdom, the insight about emptiness, the insight about no self, like these insights. And so the idea is, is that there are certain things that we could do that take us further and further and further away from the insight. And there's other activities we could do that, that draw near to that insight. But the interesting thing about all of this is that the insight will be that there was nobody doing any of that. But what we want to look at is behaviors that will never lead to that realization in that way. And so that's where you get, it's what the Buddhists talk about. It's what the Bodhisattvas talk about in particular. It's the idea that although there is no giver and no recipient and no karmic reward for giving, what they say is, but giving is not in vain even though there's no giver, no recipient, and no karmic rewards, it's not in vain. And that's what I just tried to describe, is how it could be that there's no giver, no gift, no recipient, but that it's not useless to be generous. All right. So everybody doing okay? Okay. So let's go deeper. So this sutra is a very interesting sutra. Again, it's called the Upaya Sutra. And it's kind of a, um, it's an odd sutra. It's got all of these kind of interesting little asides, these list, little kind of interesting sub stories. And so I already read, uh, maybe two weeks ago, I read this section and the section is a story, and I th think it's really important to remember that this is a story coming out of a book, all right? 
but it's a story about a bodhisattva. And actually what happens is, is that one of the monks, so one of the practitioners of the early form of Buddhism named Ananda, Ananda says that he saw a bodhisattva named uh, King Honored by All, and the bodhisattva was sitting on the same couch as a woman. And Ananda freaked out and went and basically told the Buddha that, oh my God, bodhisattva so-and-so broke the precepts and was sitting on a couch with a woman. And ultimately, what happens is, well, I'll just tell you, let me see if I can. Well, I'll just paraphrase this, because again, I already read it a few weeks ago. But what happens is, is that the Buddha tells Ananda, you've got it all wrong. The Bodhisattva, king honored by all, and I, I believe that the, the Bodhisattva even sleeps actually with the woman. Like, so they, I believe they even, it's eluded that they even have intercourse. And what the Buddha says is, is that there's this backstory that Ananda didn't know about. And the backstory was basically about how this woman was going to kill herself if Bodhisattva so-and-so didn't, didn't acquiesce and sleep with her. The Bodhisattva, out of compassion for this woman so that she won't kill herself and all of that, decides to stay with her, but then uses the opportunity to teach her the Dharma. And Ananda didn't know that. He didn't know the backstory that the Bodhisattva was coming from a place of compassion. And so ultimately, the kind of funny part of the story is that the Buddha says, Ananda, you're the one who's committed the transgression because you're calling out Bodhisattva so-and-so and you don't even know what you're talking about. That's a transgression. So that's a kind of interesting, like, uh, a reversal of fortune there, where it's actually Ananda who gets outed as being the transgressor, not the Bodhisattva. But this is a section that I wanted to read and then mention something. So, well, I'll just read the end part. Actually, I'm going to read a little bit more. So, by the way, after the Bodhisattva king honored by all gets accused of uh, uh, transgression, he ascends in the air to, I think, to the, to the height of seven palm trees and floats in the middle of the air. And there's basically an understanding that he couldn't levitate if he had actually committed a transgression. It's part of the lore of Buddhism. And thereupon, Bodhisattva king honored by all descended from midair, bowed down with his head at the Buddha's feet and said to the Buddha, world honored one, suppose out of great compassion for a person and in order to cause them to accumulate wholesome dharmas, a bodhisattva who practices upaya apparently or actually commits misdeeds serious enough for them to fall into the great hell realms and remain there for hundreds of thousands of kulpas. Then their virtuous vow not to forsake a single person would enable them to bear all the evils and sufferings of that hell realm. So because they're a bodhisattva that's made the compassion of universal awakening, they wouldn't suffer. Then the world honored one praised bodhisattva king honored by all saying, excellent, excellent, Kulaputra, noble child, a bodhisattva who has achieved 
such a compassionate mind commits no heavy transgressions, even if they enjoy the five sensual pleasures, they are free from all transgressions and from all karmas leading to miserable planes of existence. So what I want to talk about as an extension of this conversation about wisdom. So that section about a bodhisattva that's coming from a place of compassion who has made the vow, the bodhisattva vow of universal awakening, even it says, even if they apparently or actually <laughs> commit gross misdeeds, there's no transgression. So experiencing or enjoying the five sense pleasures. So this is, as uh, you might know, if you were here for the first class, this is a, a very old Buddhist Mahayana Sutra. But what that section right there, and yeah, we have a little time, so we might read a little more, but right there, what that section well, what I kind of want to uh, kind of start to get to is that eventually there arises in the world of Buddhism a third path. So not the Hinayana, not the Mahayana, but the Vajrayana, the tantric, esoteric Buddhist path. So. The Vajrayana, the way of the Vajra, is, of course, mostly associated with Tibetan Buddhism, but this type of Buddhism is practiced in other cultures as well. But, of course, one of the things that the Tantric Vajrayana path is known for is, of course, Tantric sex, that idea that in the tantric path, in the Vajrayana, there's this understanding that it is per permissible under certain circumstances to engage in sexuality. In fact, in some Tibetan traditions, it's okay to engage in intoxication for the right reasons. It's okay to engage in a lot of things that would otherwise be transgressive, but because of the samkalpa, because of the intention, they are not considered transgressions. And so what I want you to do, and actually it's one of the reasons why in the Dharma doors, it's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in exploring this collection of sutras this collection of sutras, the Ratnakuta collection, it has a lot of these sutras that are kind of basically early Vajrayana sutras. So these are still totally mainline Mahayana Bodhisattva sutras, but there's a few of these like this one that they start to open the door to what would become the Vajrayana. And part of the Vajrayana is, of course, this, well, kind of sanctioned transgression in that way. And so what I'm kind of wanting to do tonight, and this is going to probably spill into next week and beyond, is that I kind of wanted to give you the, um, the dharmic logic, like the philosophical logic for the Vajrayana of like, well, how could it be that the Vajrayana allows for sexual practices if Buddhism began as this hyper-celibate tradition? Like, how did we get there? This is how we got there. And there's a couple of things going on here, but the one thing that I would come back to is that Vajrayana Buddhism all of it, by the way, like the entire Vajrayana tradition, it all comes out of the Bodhisattva Mahayana Buddhist path that is entirely founded on the idea of emptiness. 
So we have already kind of crossed a threshold when we are in like this kind of realm of emptiness because there's this kind of understanding that, well, that all of this is rather illusory or dreamlike. All of it is dreamlike in that way. And if everything is dream like, it's not that you're dreaming, but everything is conceptual and mental and therefore kind of dreamlike. If everything is sort of dreamlike and conceptual and empty in that way, then there's sort of kind of, well, celibacy, sexuality, they're sort of both empty in that way. Now, this is the philosophical underpinning of all of this. I want to definitely go back to the teaching of compassion, this teaching about the generosity and the giving, because the idea is, is that the story about bodhisattva king honored by all, the story is, is that that bodhisattva didn't have any sexual desire. The bodhisattva basically didn't even really want to have sex, but due to these circumstances, was like, yeah, okay, let's have sex. The idea being that the bodhisattva's point of view was coming from this kind of a place of wisdom, which is saying all of this is empty anyways, and then a place of compassion and kindness for this person in that way. And so because they were steeped in wisdom and compassion, there's no transgression in that way. Now, the thing that I'll mention about, oh yeah, please, please, any questions, comments, ideas? Yeah, Noe. Hey, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. So the Bodhisattva uh, made a choice. He, he made a choice, or that, the Bodhisattva made a choice. Who made the choice? If there's no being, if there's no self, he had a choice was made. And to choose to break a precept because I feel like it, or I assume that I'm doing a good thing by, you know, uh, sleeping with somebody or taking drugs or drinking because, you know, I think this is the right thing for me as a Bodhisattva. It's, it's kind of misleading, I think. For me, it, it, who made the choice? Yep. Thank you. Excellent question. So in, in, if you put it that way, the idea, of course, going back to the idea of no gift, no giver, the understanding, the, the place of wisdom that the Bodhisattva is coming from in the story is you are right, Noe. The Bodhisattva understands that there's nobody making that choice to do that. But here's the thing. The idea of what you described, where there is a self-interested bodhisattva, self-interested in their own pleasure, self-interested in, in that way, that is not what was described, and it's not the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva is, in, is completely responding to the other the needs of the other in that way. Please, no, oh, yeah. But that sounds delusional. That's a delusion. I could, I could you know, I, a person could then say, oh, well, gee, I want uh, this, uh, I'm going to respond to this. It's, it's, it's the opinion of this, this corporeal coil, this mortal coil that's, perhaps being driven towards that idea or justification of drinking or using or, you know, uh, it, it's a, it, to me, it comes out that it's a, it's a, yeah, I don't know, Michael, it sounds like an excuse. It sounds like a delusion. Like I can, I can go out and drink now after not drinking for 15 years because I'm going to help somebody 
get sober. <laughs> and I know better because I can't drink. So I don't know. It comes across as a bit of a, 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 a loose cannon. If I so, so Noe, you are completely anticipating where I was going with this talk. My point is, is that my feeling about it is, is that this, it should always be remembered that this is a story. And it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a parable. It has a moral that they're trying to talk about where compassion trumps everything. That kind of, that's the idea. But I agree with you, Noe, that I do believe that many of the, particularly the Vajrayana teachers who have fallen from grace, who have been, you know, either uh, sexual relationships with students or all kinds of other things. I agree with you, Noe. I think that the message of this got, gets misconstrued. And it becomes this idea of, oh, and it, almost an excuse in that way. I think it is a dangerous teaching in that way. It's why I think that the Vajrayana should be only practiced under tutelage or guidance, but that teacher needs to be righteous in that way. So, Noe, I'm with you 100% in that way. I, I would still like encourage us to be thinking about the sort of um, like, I, I kind of, I all, in a situation like this, I kind of always want to use a kind of parental analogy where the parent in sort of is being asked of something from the child that they themselves really wouldn't want to do, but kind of acquiesce for the benefit of the child. And the point being that they really don't have their self-interest they have the child's interest in mind and it should be like for me noe and again noe thanks for you know saying all of that i really really you know wanted to make sure all of that got said but for me it's about like the kind like let's take um i mean it's so tricky it's so tricky with a lot of this, but it's sort of, I wanna like focus on the mindset of a bodhisattva who would almost be in a position to transgress a precept that they don't wanna transgress. <laughs> like they really don't want to, but the compassion for the other is really what is most important in that moment. And so they do like, they do this, but it's such a slippery slope, especially because we are such flawed humans. It's what the Dharma is about is how flawed we are. And so this idea that I can make a skillful decision to transgress a precept, it, it needs to be done with such, such care that one should probably avoid it entirely, frankly. And it's why I kind of mentioned that this is a story and not a recommendation for our practice in that way. So, okay. Um, let's... Yeah, so that we're going to pause there. There's some really great things coming up in the sutra. So we're going to get to those next week and continue this conversation. Um, yeah, any kind of other last uh, thoughts or ideas about wisdom, upaya, or even this tricky question that Noe raised? <clears throat> yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Um, That'll conclude uh, this portion on skillful wisdom. I hope uh, we got something out of this evening. Um, 